Well, where did it happen? Um, Sendai, here on the northeast coast of Honshu, the main uh, Japanese island, it occurred off the northeast coast about 80 miles from uh, Sendai. Uh, the depth of the earthquake was initiated at about 24 kilometers. And distance-wise, this is about 230 miles northeast of Tokyo. And here in a, in a view is the plate boundary, the Japanese trench, the Japan Trench coming by here. Earthquake was between Honshu and the Japanese Trench. The big story is that the Pacific Plate is moving in an east-northeast direction with respect to the Eurasia Plate. It dives down into the Japanese Trench here, and it dives beneath the Japanese islands. Um, it's growing at a pretty good rate. The convergence rate here is about 8 centimeters per year. And as a consequence, what that means is this is a very seismically active area. To make that point, here are earthquakes plotted. These are earthquakes from 1990 to present. You can't see Honshu underneath all these earthquakes here. The earthquakes are color-coded in depth in kilometers. So Pacific Plate here. Japan Trench is shown by the red line here. And notice that the earthquakes get deeper, deeper, deeper as you proceed across this subduction zone from, west, or from east to west. So a cross section in this area here is shown. And we've got the Pacific Plate going down here. The interface between the Pacific Plate and the plate that carries Japan is shown right here. So earthquake happened right on the shallow portion of that plate boundary before the great earthquake happened on March 11, there was a magnitude 7.2 earthquake that occurred uh, on the Tuesday, March 9 um, of that week. And we did an earthquake notice on, on that um, earthquake. Little did we know at the time that that magnitude 7.2 was a foreshock to this great earthquake that was to occur 48 hours later. So on this animation here, we'll see the foreshock and then we will see the main shock. So here we go. There's the foreshock, the 7.2, and its aftershock swarm. There's the 9.0. Its aftershock swarm is decorating the zone that got moved, the rupture area that got moved during the main earthquake. And of course, there have been hundreds of aftershocks. They're still going on. They will go on for many months, if not a few years, after an event of this size. Most of these aftershocks have been magnitude 6s, 5s, and 4s, and so forth, happening very, very frequently. Um, the aftershocks are useful in the seismological sense that they give you the idea, the area, you know, that has been displaced in the main shock. So this is, in essence, the rocks in the area of the rupture zone readjusting to the new state of stress in this area. Um, Genda produces a, an animations that go along with the teachable moment, and they show how the seismic waves got from the earthquake um, to the west coast of the US. So in a block diagram here, you've got the Japanese <laughs> islands on the overriding plate in this subduction zone. And then you've got the Pacific plate diving down beneath the Japanese islands. And in this animation, it'll show how the waves got from the earthquake to my basement. So there's the earthquake. There's Portland. Rotate the earthquake to the North Pole position like is shown in most of the textbooks. Cut the Earth open. Earthquake happens. Red lines here, these rays are P waves. They're the fast waves. Their motion is back and forth along the direction of wave travel. And it moves the building up and down. So we're building a cartoon seismogram here to show what the arrivals are. Then there's the S waves in blue shown here, they'll wiggle the building sideways there. And then you've got the surface waves coming around the perimeter of the Earth. They're slower, but they have larger magnitude. So this is what the cartoon seismogram looks like. And then Jenna is going to superimpose the actual observed seismogram for this event on top of it. So this is the actual recording of that event on the University of Portland seismometer, which lives in my basement. So when I'm asked, uh, how long after this earthquake occurred did I know that it happened? The answer is 10 minutes. Because it took the fastest waves, it took the P waves 10 minutes to get from Japan to my basement. And I, kinda, I have 
the record of my uh, seismometer up on my computer screen at all times, so I'm looking at it all the time. From inside of buildings in Tokyo, indeed Tokyo experienced about six minutes of very strong ground shaking. It's a testament to the earthquake preparedness and earthquake engineering in, J in Japan that buildings did not collapse in Tokyo. Nearer to the epicenter, then you had severe ground shaking that occurred also for a duration of about six minutes. There was some damage to buildings, but the buildings you know, did pretty well um, in the actual ground shaking of the earthquake. Most of the severe damage that we're seeing was produced by the subsequent tsunami, <laughs> not, not by the ground shaking um, directly. Um, this is a picture which shows the rupture zone here. So remember, we've got Pacific Plate out here. It's diving down underneath the Japanese islands, so there's an inclined plane of the boundary between the Pacific Plate and the overriding plate that carries Japan. The hypocenter for this earthquake, that is the location in the Earth where the earthquake started, is shown by the star here. But a great earthquake like this, a magnitude 9 earthquake, doesn't move just a small patch within the Earth. It moves a big region along this fault plane. And this whole area in here moved during this earthquake. So what you're looking at here, color-coded, is how much did the opposing blocks that moved with respect to each other to produce this earthquake, how much did they move? So the rupture starts here, and it radiated down dip, or down farther deeper into the Earth. It radiated to the north, it radiated to the south, but a lot of energy and the maximum displacement actually happened closer to the surface here. In this red zone patch in here, if you look at this legend here, this is displacement in centimeters. Areas in here were offset by more than 30 meters, 100 feet of displacement between these two blocks that, that um, moved in this earthquake. Well, that's a huge displacement. And the fact that the maximum displacement was up near the surface is very, very important because what that means is if you have 100-foot displacements that are not very far below the surface of the, below the floor of the ocean, then the floor of the ocean is going to get displaced. So you have a big displacement of the floor of the ocean. That lifts up a huge mountain of ocean water, and then you're going to get a very large tsunami, which indeed, of course, did occur. These are the kind of earthquakes that we look at them. We see a great earthquake happening in a subduction zone. If it's shallow, we think immediately, oh, likely candidate to have produced a tsunami. That tsunami, of course, arrived on Japanese shorelines here in Honshu within about 20 minutes of when the earthquake occurred. So there was not much time for the Japanese to get out of the way. On a global scale, this is indeed a, you know, it's a, it's a, a, a sort of a century dur duration, huge, huge um, earthquake. Over the course of the past 111 years, it's tied for fourth largest earthquake here tied with Kamchatka earthquake of 1957. So we've seen this big, um, big confluence of earthquakes here, Sumatra, December 26, 2004, the Chile earthquake um, last February, and then the March 11 Japan event. Well, this animation here will show us a bit of how, uh, of how things move. So this is Pacific Plate going down beneath Japan. We're going to animate this. So Jenda made this animation. And uh, we're also going to look at this GPS station here, because we can monitor deformation both during an earthquake and leading up to an earthquake with GPS receivers. And a lot of these are, are stationed over Japan. In the subduction zone, the overlying plate is locked to the subducting oceanic plate by immense friction along the shallow portion of a vast sloping fault surface. Recent GPS data show that the land above the subduction zone is indeed being pushed backward, deforming in response to the stress. Arrows mark the original locations of the leading edge of the overlying plate and the GPS unit. The plates can lock together until they overcome the frictional stress in a process called elastic rebound. This produces magnitude 8 to magnitude 9 great earthquakes. And if the land is displaced beneath the ocean as it does in this simplified animation, it causes tsunami. This cycle 
of blocking and building stress followed by catastrophic release repeats every few hundred years. Well, you saw that the GPS station moved slowly, slowly backwards, which would be towards the west, and then during the earthquake it jumped. It jumped towards the east. And this was indeed observed in Japan. So the Japanese have a very dense network of these high-precision um, GPS receivers. And the maximum horizontal displacements that were experienced here, the, the uh, epicenter is here, were about 4.42 meters. So 14 and a half feet. So literally the coastline of northern Honshu moved outwards, moved towards the east by uh, up to uh, 14 and a half feet. Also moved vertically, also dropped down vertically. So over here is shown the vertical displacements. Maximum subsidence that occurred during the earthquake here was 0.75 meters or about two and a half feet. Some of the flooding which we are seeing now in coastal Japan is due um, to this subsidence. So some areas literally that were above sea level prior to this earthquake are now in the intertidal zone. So example, here's a before and after picture. And some of this flooding, this inundation that we see in here may be permanent in that this area dropped down with respect to sea level.